Hello, this is the preliminary design report for the fall 2022 semester. We are Team 17B, also known as Team Gizmo, of the Acrobot project. My name is Nicole Alvarado, and I'll be starting off our presentation today. And here we have our table of contents. We'll be starting off with background of the project of the team. We'll be talking about organization, and we'll also talk about our design overview of our systems and subsystems. We'll talk about the progress that we've made over the semester. We'll show our budget. We'll talk about some risks that we've identified. And finally, we'll end with a summary. To introduce our project, we begin with introducing Disney Centronics Spider-Man. As you can see in the video to the right hand side performing a trick that is well beyond the capabilities of human performers. So this really does bring superheroes to life. It was developed for the Web Slinger stunt show at California Adventure and it took Disney Imagineers years to develop this. It's very complex. As you can see performing very complex tricks. So eventually they developed this robot to be able to perform at least six Spider-Man stunt sequences and we'll be getting into how they started off. The sophisticated animatronic stunt man that we see in the previous slide didn't always have the form of the amazing Spider-Man that we see today. It originally started off with a prototype lovingly nicknamed Stickman, as you can see, being held by Morgan Pope in this image. He is a research scientist at Disney Imagineering, and it was a three-limb design consisting of 3D printed plastics. It was made up of an aluminum material. It utilized microprocessors and overall weighed in at 95 kilograms. This was the beginning of uncharted territory as something in animatronics had never been developed for this and Imagineers coined the term stuntronics eventually leading into what we see today. And on the right hand side we can see Team 17B's prototype Gizmo and we'll be talking about how Stickman influenced Team 17B's Acrobot project. The objective of Team 17B is to define, design, and produce an autonomous robot that's able to perform acrobatic stunts, also interface with a trapeze bar that is part of a trapeze system where it will be launched from and swung into a release point where it will be in free fall and perform a stunt. So along with introducing the background on our project, we want to introduce some background on our team. Again, I'm Nicola Alvarado and I am the systems engineering lead and a member of the Trapeze team. Next, we have Michael DeLeon. He's our mechanical engineering subsystem lead and one of our physics specialists. We have David Gonzalez, who is our electrical engineering subsystem lead and our software specialist. Next, we have Jesse Hernandez, who is our project manager, CAD technician, and many, many other roles, including budget specialist and a member of the Trapeze team as well. We have Lilith Gazeri. She is our lead analyst and physics specialist. And next, we have Antonio Rubin, who is our Acrobot project mechanical design engineer, and he is also our safety officer, as well as a Trapeze team member. In this slide, we have our project management workflow. At the very top of it, as we mentioned in the slide previously, we have our project manager, Jesse Hernandez. From there, if we focus on the middle section of our diagram, we see that we have our lead systems engineer, whose role is to ensure that the electrical, mechanical, and software subsections all coordinate with each other and give information to each other as the workflow progresses and the project continues. We have our electrical engineer lead who coordinates with the software specialist. We have our mechanical engineer who coordinates with our CAD technicians. And overall, the engineering section of this workflow coordinates with the trapeze specialist. To the right hand side, we have our lead analyst and she coordinates with our assistant analysts as well as our physics specialists. On the far left hand side, we have our lead administrative section and that coordinates with our safety officer and with our budget specialists. Overall, our team of five, each member has many roles within the team and this just ensures that we all communicate with each other and we grow as a team as the project progresses. 
As we mentioned in our team objective, our autonomous robot is tasked with being able to perform a trick. Here at position one on the upper right hand side, we'll see that Gizmo is hoisted up at a position where it'll be ready to launch. And at this point, you can also see in the white lettering, we have several modes that we're depicting. So at this point of time, when it is attached to the launch tower, our calibration mode will begin. Once calibration mode sequence is over, we will then initialize the trapeze launch mode. And from that, we'll have an autonomous mechanism that is able to detach from the launch tower. And this will send Gizmo down into a pendulum swing, going from position one, two, up to three. On this first swing, we won't release and we'll be coming back down to position two, up to one, and beginning to come back with more momentum. We'll swing back up towards position three, and as we do that, we're starting our swing momentum mode. At that point, that's specified with the blue star, we'll then release it again autonomously at a specified angle through our analysis as we'll go into detail with in a little bit later. At that point, we'll be releasing Gizmo from the trapeze swing itself, and we'll go into swing launch mode. Once it's in the air and free fall, we'll go into trick mode, and this is a part of our trick phase, which will then initiate a um, mechanism that will swing our arms and start a flip forward over and also be twisting at the same time. So this will be our representation of what our objective is for our team. Hello, so my name is Jesse Hernandez and I'll be introducing the mechanical subsystem progress in which I will begin by discussing the Acropod concept designs that our team rigorously determined at the beginning of the semester through the referencing of available resources such as trapeze artists and their trapeze acts. In the mechanical subsystem progress, it is comprised of three sections, the Acropod concept designs that I have already mentioned, the trapeze grip mechanism selection table in which it goes in depth on the specific grip mechanism that has been considered for our Acrobot. And finally, the CAD design that was created in SOLIDWORKS alongside its specifications and parameters. Hello, Jesse Hernandez again. So now I will begin by introducing the Acrobat concept design. So simply put, there were three designs that seemed the most feasible given our newfound knowledge of trapeze artists as well as the information and feedback that we had received from Morgan Pope the research scientists at Disney Imagineering, who encouraged us right away to start on our concept design to see what would be the most readily and effective design for our first prototype. So here I provided an image of all the concept designs that we first went through. Concept design one, two, and three, they all inhabit many pros, but of course with any mechanical design, there usually comes the limitations behind them that must be considered beforehand. So. So to begin, number one was the first design we all discussed. It is made up of a two, two by four wooden limb that are connected vertically. Um, the pros, we want to first start off by saying that it's very sturdy material and it was a great idea to begin using wood as it's very flexible and it's testing of all the calculations that we were considering, but as well, there are many cons. So it might be too simplistic in a design that it would not be able to do the complex design that we were now considering having done more discussions on the trapeze act that we wanted to, our acrobat to perform. And given that it would be only two two by four wooden limbs, it would not have enough uh, momentum once it's released from the pendulum swing of the trapeze bar. So due to this limitation, we had to move on to another concept design that would be more in line with our new found ideas. So for concept design number two, it is now made of three two by four wooden limbs connected vertically, but now with two arms on the side of the acrobat's midsection area to now accommodate for the twisting maneuver that our team wanted our acrobat to uniquely perform now. So with these with this new concept design comes the pros. Given the extra core cool vertical limb added at now and allowed our acrobat to be able to perform trapeze acts like a trapeze artist as it was very similar to the body of an actual human being. Given the far more advanced design, 
Uh, it allowed for not a twisting maneuver as well, since the last design only had two limbs vertically. So, but this also had some cons to it as well. It did not have a way to autonomously balance itself after arriving from an initial flight pattern. So, in other words, it would only fall into maybe now a net or a padding system in which we now had to consider for the trapeze subcommittee. It did not have a miss uh, gripping mechanism for the upper limb in which it would attach to the trapeze bar. So this would now also have to be considered as well. And finally, the material that we had chosen for this would be wood. And wood is very efficient given that it's the first prototype but we might consider changing material later on to accommodate any design changes or iterations of multiple swinging patterns and testing during our phases in the spring semester. Finally, we have our concept design number three, which is still, of course, made by three two by four wooden limbs that are connected vertically, but now with reaction wheels connected at the bottom of it to balance itself after launching from the trapeze tower and the trapeze itself. Uh, once again, the actual limbs are very beneficial and the reaction wheel will be able to gradually balance it on a solid surface after arriving from a swing. So this would disregard the idea of having a net. However, again, there were some cons. The reaction wheel attached to the lower half of the body may bring about concerns of imbalance and forming a trapeze act due to the limbs giving an extra weight to the actual uh, acrobat, and this might affect the center of mass of it and affect the whole trajectory of our acrobat. And the added reaction wheels seem very in concept difficult to create given all the other tasks that we had to consider. So in the end, we decided given these pros and cons that concept design number two would be the best fit for our first prototype. And after today, we were communicating this to Morgan Probe, who came to our preliminary design review expo. He gave us some feedback and communicated to us that he also agreed that we were on the right path choosing concept design number two. Wood is very flexible. Our acrobat would be able to perform these acts given the calculations that we had done. And barring a few minor hiccups that would need to be taken into consideration in the future, Concept design number two seemed the best fit for our Acrobat team for our first prototype. Hello, my name is Michael De Leon, and I'm here to talk about the Gizmo Acrobat design. Uh, for stars, since we're trying to mimic the movement of the human body, and, uh, and also by watching how gymnasts do their moves, uh, we inspire our design, of course, on the human body, but we also got some inspiration from the Stickman project from Disney. So because of that, our design has a head, a torso, one leg, and two arms. So you can see here, this is the front view, this is the side view, top view, and the isometric view. So on this isometric view, you can see that uh, the material, it's wood, uh, specifically Douglas firm. And we chose this material because, at least for now, is is cheap to make and is uh, wood is also really easy to work with. So that's the reason why uh, we chose that material. Uh, so these are the specifications from the Gizmo. As I mentioned before, the material is Douglas firm, which is wood. Uh, this is a type of wood very common in the construction industry. Uh, the density of Douglas firm is 530 kilograms over meter cube. We're basing on our calculations on gravity being 9.81 meters over second square. Uh, torque length is basically the length between the pin joint and the center of mass of the limb we're trying to calculate torque for. Uh, total members, as I said before, it's five. We have a head, which has a length of 16 inches. The torso, which has a length of 18 inches. Uh, the leg, which, which has a length of 16 inches. And each arm uh, with a length of 10 inches. Every member is going to have a constant width of 3.5 inches, which you can see here at the bottom, and the thickness is going to be 1.5 inches, which you can see here on the right side of the design. 
and also we're going to have two different torques working on our design as you can see the leg and the head are the same side therefore uh, they're going to have the same torque that we call that torque one you can see right here torque one for the leg torque one for the head and also each arm has the exact same dimensions which means that they are going to have the same torque that would be torque number two which was calculated already and presented in the next slide Uh, here we have more specifications for our design as you saw in the previous slide uh, our dimensions are in inches uh, but we consider that working with the metric system would be easier for us so we converted all those dimensions into a metric system and therefore we have here our volume in uh, meters cube or weight in newtons and our mass in kilograms um, so a quick rundown here uh, member number one and three are the same dimensions uh, number member one is the head member three is the leg uh, the volume for both of them is 0 0.00137 meters cube number two is the torso uh, we only have one of those is 0 0.00154 member four and six are the arms and the volume for those is 0 0.0086 which gives us a total volume of 0 0.06 meters cube uh, the same thing with with the weights in newtons um, the total weight for our uh, our design is 3.1958 newtons and the total mass is 3.18 kilograms um, as i mentioned in the previous slide we have torque number one and torque number two torque number one being the the torque that we need to move the leg and also the head which are the same dimensions and torque number two is the torque needed to move each arm um, so that was calculated already and torque one turned out to be 7.6 newton stance meter and torque number two 3.3 newton stance meter and that's it for the specifications thank you so now that we have an idea of the dimensions, the material, as well as having our first prototype of Gizmo built, we need to, to further develop our movement mechanisms. And so this um, is just showing our down selection table for our grip mechanism. And we have three categories of options. So we have a electromagnet, a solenoid, and a lock style solenoid. Those three options were put into the down selection table where you can see they were compared by their uh, values and scores that we have created for our, our traits. So we have a minimum diameter as the trapeze swing will have a bar that has a diameter of 1.27 centimeters. We have another trait of being minimum holding mass, which means that we have to be able to support the mass of our robot with this grip mechanism and we also have cost. So with these three very uh, simple and general ideas, we were able to give relative weight to each of those categories and assign a value based on data that we were able to collect for each of these three mechanisms. Overall, as we can see, the electromagnet ended up being the highest scoring option for the grip mechanism. However, at this point and at this stage of our development, we are still uh, looking forward to developing other ideas and essentially coming up with something that's robust enough, reliable enough, and most likely simple enough to be able to execute this grip mechanism release as often as we plan on doing it. So at this moment, we have our electromagnet option being at the top, However, there are some other options that we're still investigating and that we'll be looking into further throughout the winter session. So as you can see from this picture, our acrobat is going to have uh, two different phases. One would be the swing phase and the other one would be the trick phase. Uh, the swing phase is the one that Acrobot will be holding from the trapeze bar and in physics term that's called uh, circular motion. 
And the part that it releases from the trapeze bar, it would be called projectile motion. And each of these would be discussed in the next two slides. The picture on the left shows the free body diagram of the circular motion. And as you can see, we were able to show a point mass instead of the robot because the center of the mass of the robot would follow the same trajectory as a point mass. And there are two forces acting on the point mass, which is the uh, force, uh, force of the tension and the weight force. And we have two terms, h, lowercase h, and uppercase h. Uppercase h is just the height from the floor to the radius of the curvature, which is six foot. And the lowercase h indicates the length of rope, which is uh, 10 foot. Our starting angle is negative 90 degrees. After understanding which forces were acting on our uh, point mass, we were able to find the correct equations, physics equations, in order to uh, use in MATLAB and be able to solve for the unknowns. And as you can see, this graph, angular position and velocity versus time, was generated in MATLAB, and it gives us several information about our circular motion. For example, we can see that what the maximum uh, angular velocity is, the highest point, which is 2.5 radians per second, uh, the value of angular velocity at the time of the release, which is 1.7584 radians per second, uh, which equals to 5.2 meters per second, and the time when the angular velocity is zero again, and that is after 2.04 seconds. The free body diagram of projectile motion is shown on the left hand side. It is important to note that because we knew the angular velocity from the circular motion, we were able to convert that into our um, linear velocity and have information about the velocity at the time of the release. So as we can see, we are able to convert that into uh, again, x and y direction, and solve for velocity in the x direction, y direction, um, and displacement in x and y direction. Once the equation of motion uh, in 2D were inputted into MATLAB, we were able to generate the three graphs that are shown on the uh, right-hand side. The first graph is x position versus y position, and the black line, which is the 61 degree release angle, we can see that gives us a release height of 3.5804 meters and a travel distance of 3.5 meters. The second graph is Y position versus time. And one of the most important aspects for our team was to be able to fly for the longest time. Therefore, we decided to go with the 61 degrees which gave us a flight time in the air of 1.42 seconds. The last graph is velocity versus time. And as we can see, as the robot will, uh, will fall down, it will gain velocity. And the maximum velocity that we will have is 15.18 meters per second. Okay, so now let's talk about the electrical subsystem of our Acrobot. So our first electronic component is the IMU and its sensors. So what is an IMU? An IMU is an inertial measurement unit, which consists of a three axis accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer. When combined, it measures the orientation and motion with respect to an inertial reference frame. A gyroscope is an angular rotation rate sensor. It measures the speed at which an object will be moving in the X, Y, and Z directions in radians per second or degrees per second. Second, secondly, a accelerometer measures acceleration. More specifically, it measures linear and gravitational acceleration. Lastly, a magnetometer measures magnetism. It can find orientation using the Earth's magnetic field similar to a compass. So now why specifically an IMU? Well, an IMU helps us find the orientation of our acrobat during its pendulum-like motion. And if we find this orientation, then we will be able to perform the desired swinging motion and trick that was desired. So now how will it do this? Well, the IMU is basically going to read the necessary roll, pitch, and yaw angles. So what are these angles? If we look to the figure on our right, the rotational angle around the side-to-side -side axis is roll, which is in green. 
the rotational angle around the horizontal axis, which can be shown in blue, is the yaw, and the front to back axis will be the pitch, and that is displayed in red. In conjunction, all these three angles will produce, will produce the full position and orientation of the acrobat in 3D space. Okay, so now you probably might be thinking, why not use a separate, a separate gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer? Well, instead of using any one of these sensors individually, an IMU was chosen as the optimal choice since each sensor individually has its downsides. For example, the gyroscope has gyro biasing and gyro drift. Gyro biasing is the event in which the gyroscope is not in motion and is still reading a non-zero value. This is a traditional characteristic of a gyroscope. This is an important characteristic to note because if these values were to be integrated over a certain time frame, it will produce an angle that will continue to increase despite it being still. This is called gyro drift. The same concept can be said about accelerometers and magnetometers. They each have their type of biasing and offset that must be accounted for. To decrease or get rid of these offsets, filters or a type of sensor fusion filter must be applied to the IMU or to the individual sensors to achieve fairly accurate results, hence the reason for the IMU. The IMU allows us to implement these type of filters. This will be further explained in the software subsystem for the IMU. To properly assess which IMU was appropriate for our Acrobat, the team performed a trade table analysis. The IMUs that were analyzed were the Adafruit VNO055, MPU6050, and ICM2062. As previously mentioned, the IMU consists of three axis sensors, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and sometimes a magnetometer. Since IMUs contain multiple individual sensors, the team first analyzed the IMU as a whole unit. As seen in the table, factors like degrees of freedom, or labeled DOF, communication methods, power consumption, cost, weight, and dimensions were taken into consideration. First, the degrees of freedom exhibited the three axes possible and how many the IMU senses per sensor. The communication method is another huge factor since it will be ideal for our sensor to be able to communicate with our selected microcontroller. Power consumption is another important factor since we want the microcontroller to be able to supply enough voltage and current to power the sensor. Lastly, traditional factors like weight, dimensions, and cost were used to determine the amount of space, weight, and price that the IMU would take on our Acrobot. Now, each sensor on the IMU was looked at individually. So in this case, the comparison was primarily between the accelerometer and the gyroscope for all three IMUs that can be seen on your right. The reason for not including the magnetometer is because the magnetometer was only available for the VNO055. However, these uh, specifications for the magnetometer were still taken into consideration. So for each sensor, which meaning the gyroscope and accelerometer, we compared their gravity range, interface, the number of measured axes, current consumption, analog voltage supply, and zero G, offset and accuracy. The accelerometer's gravity range is important to note since we would prefer an adjustable upper and lower limit of what the accelerometer can measure, also known as, known as its range, according to the amount of g's slash g's force being dealt with while our acrobat is swinging. We can perform this value to be similar to the g's being dealt with, which in turn will provide better measurements. The gyroscope's measurement range or full scale range is the maximum angular velocity that the gyroscope can read in degrees per second. This factor is important to observe because ideally we would want the gyroscope to be able to read the speeds of the acrobat. Furthermore, the number of axes is important to observe as it states the number of axes that the accelerometer and gyro can pick up. The current consumption and analog supply voltage states how much power the gyroscope and accelerometer use out of the total needed for the IMU. 
The last important factor to observe is the IMU's zero-g offset. The name zero-g offset describes the sensor you're reading when exposed to a zero-g condition. A perfect sensor would output values of zero under this zero-g condition. Any sensor reading deviating from this zero-g condition is the offset or sensor bias. This is important to note because we need to account for this offset when calculating the angles based on the IMU. So overall, based on this analysis and comparison, the team decided that the best and optimal choice for our Acrobot is the BNO055. This decision came down to its ability to provide raw data, calculate the resulting vector, communication compatibility with our microcontroller, and its multiple degrees of freedom. Now let's move on to our second electronic component, which is our motors. In order to make our Acrobot perform the desired actions mentioned throughout, a variety of motors ranging from steppers to servos were considered throughout our design process. The team took into consideration the differences between steppers and servos to determine which would be best for our Acrobot application. The main reason why the team deviated from using steppers is because steppers provide a large amount of torque, but at slower speeds. This is not ideal in the case of our Acrobot because we need a motor that can provide a large amount of torque at a very rapid speed. On the bright side, servo motors provide this. Servo motors allow for precise control of position, velocity, and acceleration without sacrificing the torque it provides. Taking all these considerations in mind and analyzing them, we decided upon servo motors. The motors that were chosen were NEMA 34 Technic motors, which an example can be seen on the right-hand side. These motors have digital servo drivers, trajectory generators, and an internal controller built into the motor. Hence, there is no need for any external or extra motor drivers, shields, etc. With these motors, we can simply connect the microcontroller directly to our motor without worrying about current drops or rises when connecting them. The team performed another trade table analysis in order to determine which NEMA 34 motor would be the best for our application. There were various factors taken into consideration while choosing the specific servo motor. These factors include frame size, motor type, optimal voltage, max speed or RPMs, peak torque, continuous torque, achievable resolution, shaft dimensions, motor dimensions, weight, and cost. The top determining factors were the motor's optimal voltage to ensure that the power supply could have enough voltage to power the motors, max speed at optimal voltage, to guarantee that we could achieve the appropriate amount of speed, peak torque and continuous torque at optimal voltage to ensure that the robot moves using the voltage that was provided. All of these top determining factors were analyzed using the manufacturer's website. Using their website, the team could filter which motor produced the desired torque, which in this case is 6.17 newton meters or 873 ounces inch at the desired RPMs, which was also calculated to be 224 radians per second. These values fluctuated depending on our power supply input. The team decided on a maximum of 48 volts DC as our optimal power supply. Since realistically, we would be able to find compact batteries for this voltage. Now, if we take a look at the figures that the manufacturer website provided for us, we see that at the input of input voltage of 8 volts DC, the desired torque, our desired torque was going to be able to be produced since our desired torque was around 873 ounces inch and our desired RPM was indeed um, 224 RPMs. And this is using these three motors and the motor on the right hand side would also be able to produce the same amount of torque and RPM needed. But however, 
if we look more deeply into it, the motors that would optimally provide the, a good amount of torque for a larger range of RPMs, if needed, would be models 3, 4, 3, 6, and model 3, 4, 4, 6. From this, we could optimally decide that these two motors are the best choices. This is due to the motors offering a larger torque range for larger speeds. And now the decision between the two will ultimately be decided upon before spring 2023. A combination of code and the electronics previously mentioned is needed to make our Acrobat move. To combine these two aspects into an embedded system, we need a microcontroller. A microcontroller typically contains a processor, memory, and input and output ports, which when all combined control a function or multiple functions in an electronic device. It interprets the data received from the input and output ports using its central processor. The data received is stored in the microcontroller's data memory. The processor then use, uses the stored code to apply the incoming data. It then uses the input and output ports to communicate with other electronics and to create appropriate actions. It is because of these capabilities that we need a microcontroller in our robot, and this is the reason why we use a microcontroller. The team compared the following microcontrollers using a trade table analysis. We compared the Arduino Mega, Arduino Do, Arduino Uno, Nucleo, and PSOC. For each of the microcontrollers, the programming languages, clock speeds, number of programmable pins, number of pins that provide pulse with modulation, input, and operating voltage, memory, and price were compared. We consider these to be the most important specifications since clock speeds determine how fast the controller can send out information or a signal. The programming language allows it to determine which coding language to use when coding the commands. The number of output pins also determines how many pins the team can connect the electrical components to. The number of PWM pins allows us to determine how many pins the team can connect motors to. The input and operating voltage allows us to determine the amount of power needed. The memory allows us to judge how much data the controller can store. And lastly, the price will allow the team to decide if the electronic is a viable option. Based on all these characteristics and specifications, the two major standouts were the Arduino Mega and the Arduino Uno. This is based on their clock speeds, fairly easy programming language, a large number of programmable pins and PWM pins, decent input and operating voltage, and a moderate amount of memory. The Arduino Mega is going to be used as the main controller and the Arduino Uno will be used as a secondary controller if needed. Now, lastly, if we move on to our other miscellaneous electronic components that will be part of our Acrobot, which include a release latch, light emitting diodes or LEDs, a speaker, a spring trigger, and a grip system that are still being decided upon. The electronic latch, spring trigger, and grip will be controlled using the microcontroller and relays. This will be further explained in the power distribution and software subsystem. The electronic latch will be used to release the Acrobot from its starting position. The spring trigger will spring the extra side limbs to allow that spinning rotation and movement that we desire. The grip release mechanism will trigger the Acrobot to release from the trapeze bar. To debug and evaluate the process throughout each step, simple LEDs will be turned on and off. This is important as it will allow the team to easily identify where the problem in our system is. This is going to act as our simple feedback system. Lastly, to give our Acrobot a bit of character to it, a small speaker will be connected to an NPN BD135 transistor to amplify its sound effects during the start, flight, and trick of the Acrobot. This specific transistor was chosen due to it being typically designed for an audio amplifier.
Okay, so now let's take a look at how power was distributed to all these electronic components. Each one of these electrical components and systems has its specific requirements for power. To ensure that each component receives the appropriate amount of operating power that is needed to function, a power supply has been selected for each system to distribute the proper amount of voltage and current to each component. Each electrical component has its limitations and requirements of power for safe operation. To begin with, in order to independently power an Arduino Mega microcontroller, a 9 volt battery will be used. Typically, when a 9 volt battery is connected to a load, it produces an output current of 400 to 600 milliamps, which falls under the Arduino Mega's operating parameters. These operating parameters are rated between 7 and 12 volts and a maximum current of 1 amp. From this, we can conclude that the 9 volt battery will be an optimal choice to independently power a microcontroller. The same thing can be said about the Super Uno. Components like the speaker will also be powered by this 9 volt battery. It is safe to connect the nine, this speaker to the 9 volt battery since, again, the battery produces 400 to 600 milliamps. If we use a simple power equation, we can see that with the 8 ohm speaker, the total power that it will produce is 2.88 watts, while the max power of the speaker is 3 watts, hence making it acceptable. The same thing can be said about the transistor that we are using in order to amplify the sound because the transistor's max collected current is 1.5 amps, and again, the battery produces 400 to 600 milliamps. Moving on to our next electrical component, the IMU sensor will be powered via the microcontroller's 5 volt supply. A two channel and single channel 5 volt DC relay will be used to safely power the spring, grip, and release latch. The relay allows us to control these electronic components that need large amounts of voltage and current, roughly 12 volts DC and 1 to 2 amps, through the relay's octocoupler. This octocoupler contains an LED which, when current passes through it, turns on a phototransistor and allows the current from the additional 12 volt supply to pass through safely since the transistor and LED aren't physically connected. The current passing through the relay is sunk into the microcontroller while the other current that is provided from the other supply powers the release latch, trigger, and grip. This is a valid method as long as the current being sunk into the microcontroller is still a valid current that the pin can handle. In the case of the Arduino Uno and the Arduino Mega, the GPIO pin or general purpose input and output pins can sync a maximum of 400 milliamps. According to the manufacturer, the, re the octocoupler on the relay syncs back 5 milliamps of current into the microcontroller. So in this situation, this is not a problem. Moreover, the team made a trade table analysis to properly assess which batteries would be optimal to power the motors. Based on the manufacturer's manual and description, each motor should be powered through the likes of 24 to 75 volts DC with a current range of 1 to 4 amps and a max current of 10 amps. In this trade table, we analyze the battery's voltage, current capacity, max charging rate, charging plug, discharging rate, discharging plug, dimensions, and weight. Based on the required voltage and current needed, which again was between 44 volts and 48 volts, we decided to use two 22.2 volt, 2200 milliamp hours batteries that will be placed in series to power these motors. In theory, by placing the two supplies in series, it will produce a voltage of roughly around 44.4 volts and a current of 2.2 amp hours, which is appropriate for the motors. Okay. To properly break down the first draft of the circuit schematic, 
Let's break it down into three separate parts. Part one contains the main microcontroller, Arduino Mega, a nine volt battery, the IMU, and the speaker itself. The speaker and the Arduino Mega will be in parallel since both are powered by the nine volt battery. Next to the power supply is the eight ohm three watt speaker. This speaker is connected to an MPN transistor to amplify the noise and signal produced by the Arduino Mega. The digital output signal from the Arduino Mega will be controlled via a variable resistor to control the amplification of the noise. The IMU is powered by the five volt source produced by the microcontroller. The BNO055 communicates with the Arduino Mega via the SDA, serial data, and SEL, serial clock pins. The SDA pin is used for data exchange between the Arduino Mega and the IMU. The SCL pin is used for the synchronous clock so that both the IMU and the microcontroller are on the same time. Using these pins is called I2C communication. As previously mentioned, the IMU will send all its data readings to the microcontroller. The microcontroller will then perform and distribute signal commands to all the other electronics to perform actions. Lastly, on the bottom right of the Arduino Mega, there are three LEDs, which are the feedback system LEDs and whose brightness is controlled by three resistors. In part two of the schematic, it contains the Arduino Uno, the two channel five volt DC relays, and the single channel five volt DC relay, along with the 12 volt power supply. The Arduino Uno is also powered by the nine volt DC battery. The Arduino Mega and Arduino Uno are connected to space out the electronics throughout the robot. The Mega and Uno will be in communication through the R, X, and TX pins. These R, X, and TX pins are the receiving and transmitting pins that allow the two devices to communicate. The relays are powered by the five volt supply provided by the Arduino Uno. The relays are also connected to a digital pin to which the current will sync to. The 12 volt DC supply will supply the relay for the tr spring trigger, release latch, and grip. Lastly, part three revolves around the connection of the motors. The first thing to notice is that the motors will be connected in an organized manner to the Arduino Mega via screw shields. The motor contains digital input and output pins. The enable pins of the motor energize the motor's coils. The de-energizing enable pins removes power from the coils. The input pins A and input pin B will allow for digital inputs from the microcontroller to send all our signals to the motor. Lastly, high level feedback pins will be used to output a PWM or pulse modulating width signal, whose duty cycle is proportional to the motor speed or torque. This will be further explained in the software subsystem. Lastly, as previously mentioned, a pair of 2.2 volts, 2.2 amp hour batteries in series will be used to produce power to these motors. At this point, we'll be introducing our software subsystem progress. So as we start off our software subsystem progress, we have our preliminary flow diagram. And as we look at this, we can think of it as four separate columns. The first three are associated with the swing phase, and the one to the right hand side is associated with the trick phase. So the general idea behind the flow diagram is to figure whether or not we have certain conditions met or not as we go through calibration for the IMU, as we go through calibration in whether or not our uh, BNO055 is able to speak 
to us, um, even though it's all autonomous, we still want to be able to ensure that it is communicating correctly. So this flow diagram and as our software de is uh, developed, we're making sure that we're checking at certain intervals. So at this point, at the beginning where we start off, we're going to be hoisted up at position one. If you recall with our concept of operations diagram, this flow diagram was very helpful in the development of that visual aid because it does go over the calibration mode, the launch mode from the trapeze tower. And once the IMU is able to gauge where we are in the air, it's able to uh, figure once it goes past the two separate swings before it actually gets to a point to the angle that we've specified for release. So as this is happening, our gizmo is going to have to be moving its limbs to gather more momentum within the swing phase before it releases from the trapeze. And with that being said, there are a series of conditions that need to be met. Once these conditions are all met and the second swing is complete, we reach that specified angle that we'll be launching at, we will then arrive if we follow the diagram to the right hand side and we'll then be able to start the trapeze swing release mode where we detach from the trapeze and start our trick mode where there will be one more command that dictates how our limbs, our side limbs, will be able to rotate to get Gizmo to do a full front twist. Properly used the IMU, there needs to be some sort of code or software that validates all sensors on the IMU, filters the data readings from the IMU, and allows the other electronics components to move. The two most important that will be discussed are sensor calibration and data filtering using sensor fusion. The BNO055 IMU has its self calibration code, which was provided by the manufacturer. When this provided code is compiled, it returns calibration ratings 0, 1, 2, and 3, where 0 meant no calibration was achieved, 1 and 2 meant poorly or decently calibrated, and 3 meant fully calibrated. While the calibration code is provided, each angle is going to be introduced physically by rotating the IMU device a certain number of degrees. Again, this angle is only being introduced to the system for calibration, not measuring the roll, pitch, and yaw angles. A method that the team needs to look into is how the sensor is calibrated and to prove the sensor is being calibrated appropriately despite it being from the manufacturer. The little that the team has looked into it it seems like the IMU is gathering a portion of data over a, mis a millisecond count, then integrating it using those values and adding it to the next set of incoming data. Then it averages to come up with the offset values. Based on these values, it determines which category it falls into. However, we need to ensure that the code used to calibrate the IMU is viable. This is something that is going to be worked upon during the month of December 2022. Once the calibration method itself is achieved, a method of filtering out noise and the biasing uncertainties from the roll, pitch, and yaw angles needs to be created. In other words, a type of filter needs to be applied. Since we cannot apply any physical filters to the IMU itself, we need to establish some code that will allow the data to be filtered. Since we will be dealing with three sensors, the team envisions that the best approach to perform would be through the likes of sensor fusion. In short, sensor fusion is a combination where we combine measurements from different sensors on an IMU to produce better estimates of some desired measurement parameter. The idea we have in mind is that with the accelerometer's ability for long-term data reading, the gyroscope's capability for short-term use, and the magnetometer's directional awareness, we can filter and create valid orientation estimates. This type of complementary relationship established is called a complementary filter. This type of filtering is still being explored and will be coded as software into the microcontroller by spring 2023. Okay, so now let's move on to 
the software and code that is going to be used in order to control our motors. There is only one way to control what step, direction, and position the Acrobot's NEMA 34 Technic motors move towards. The pulse with modulation method and Technic's operational mode, step and direction, are the most efficient methods to move the servo motor. The way to do this is by inputting a directional input signal to either rotate in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. These will be represented by logic values 0 and 1. 0 represents the counterclockwise direction and 1 represents the clockwise direction. Our second input would be a digital step input, which is controlled by the PWM aspect of our controller. PWM uses digital signals to control the average power across analog devices. This analog device in our case is our Technic motor. The pulse width modulation method is a fixed frequency square wave with an adjustable pulse width. The advantage of this PWM method is that it can obtain a smooth speed variation without the need of reducing the torque of the motor. The pulse width is something that we must derive based on the duty cycle ratio, the Arduino, the Arduino Mega's system clock frequency, the adjustable PWM divisor, and according to the specifications provided by the manufacturer. Now, the duty ratio is the ratio of time a signal is on compared to the time the circuit is off. This duty cycle ratio is something that we will have to explore and can be changed upon the team's desire. According to the manufacturer, the maximum pulse width input frequency must be equal to 667 kilohertz at a duty cycle of 50%. The adjustable PWM divisor can be any value as long as it helps maintain a PWM count within less than the microcontroller's 16-bit length. Lastly, all we need to do is digitally enable the motor by, set, by setting it to a logic value of 1 or by setting it to a logic value of zero in order to enable and disable the motor respectively. All of the combination of this will allow the control ability of the motor. And it can be seen here in the figure below where we can see uh, these methods. The easiest and simple method to control the extra effects, which are the LEDs, spring trigger, grip, and release latch, is by sending digital signals to each component via GPIO pins. The GPIO pins are used to send out and receive digital input and output functions. In this case, we are just sending simple digital outputs that offer sufficient current to power the relays for the grip, trigger, and release latch. All the team would do is assign the pin to toggle on at the desired time or instance in our code. This pin would be the pin to which we connect our LEDs and relays to. This method is rapid and easy to code since there are just one-time actions that will be used throughout our code. Hello, my name is Antonio Rubin, and I will be going over our trapeze subsystem progress. When discussing about our Acrobot and the Acrobot project in general, and all of the physical things that the Acrobots will be performing in the air, we need to consider a structure in which the subjects will be starting from. There is no available trapeze structure that we have at our disposal, so we must come together and figure out how we can create a structure in which the acrobats can test and perform safely. Since the acrobat project as a whole consists of five groups, each building their own acrobat, it would be ideal for everyone to be able to use the same structure to work with as the size of it is anticipated to be very tall. A subcommittee was formed, which includes representatives from all of the acrobat groups, and this committee is tasked with putting together ideas and ultimately designing, manufacturing, and assembling a trapeze structure with standardized parameters that will be agreed upon by its members. The trapeze group has come together and has determined the basic parameters for the structure, which includes a total height of 25 feet and a width of 6 feet, which includes a grip bar that the acrobats will be attaching to, which will be 12 inches in length and 20 feet in height thus allowing for a 5-foot clearance from the ground in which the acrobats can account for when positioning the subjects on the trapeze. Currently, two separate structures are being considered and developed, including a 30-foot launch tower that will include a pulley system to raise an acrobat 
to an appropriate height as some groups will be utilizing that system to put their acrobats in motion. A separate safety netting structure is also in the process of development to help bring the acrobats to a safe end to its flight. Hello, so just here in again. So now we will discuss the budget being considered for our acrobat team, as well as the budget for the trapeze subcommittee. Um, so for this section of our slides, we are referring to them as the Bill of Materials, or BOM for short. Given the prices of resources, materials, and the supplies that we are considering, I hope that the estimated total for each of the BOM is not too scary at first. Given that there's still time to consider the materials out and how much they will cost, uh, there were still some estimates to be done. But for now, the BOM that we have for both our Acrobat team and our Trapeze team seem a very good estimate of what they should be. So here we have included a basic outline of the materials and resources that would be considered. However, I would like to note that for this specific figure that we have provided, in Section 2, we will no longer be considering actuators and its subsidiary systems as we have now moved on and determined that silver motors would be the more efficient method of having the motion done on our Acrobat. This was only done after meeting with Kirk and having our discussion of how the actual motion would be on, done on, on the Acrobat. And given that on our next slide, it will still state that the initial total for this first BOM was 2,239 with 79 cents. But given that now we will not be using the actuators and its subsidiary systems, the total will now be decreasing. So thankfully, the prices have gone down, but that will be shown in the next slide. As stated before, our initial estimated total was to about $2,239.79. But once again, given that we will no longer be using actuators and its subsidiary systems, you can now disregard those and have our actual total for our estimated um, BOM. And that total would be $1,428.79. So this is nearly $800 in difference. With now using server motors as our main way of providing motion to our acrobat when it's swinging and releasing from the trapeze. We have done careful consideration of the materials and the resources that we are considering for our acrobat. And while it may seem like quite a total, being that it's in the 1000 range, hopefully this BOM is able to show exactly how much is being considered and how we will be contributing these resources onto our actual acrobat. We were able to come up with this BOM, having done some consideration of how we want to protect the electronics that will be inhabited onto the actual acrobat. And since it will be doing many iterations at a time in the spring semester, we are hopeful that once they are doing, once it is done, once it is doing the testing, that these materials will not be breaking or being damaged in the process as much since there's always some type of mistake that could be done on our part, but we are very confident on this BOM and the sections that we have provided here. Now the budget for the trapeze will be considered, and this is the BOM. Here we have provided a BOM that the trapeze subcommittee have all contributed to after considering the different type of materials that we'll be using. Myself and Nicole, from our Acrobat team were the ones tasked with designing this BOM fully for the whole Trapeze team and that would be shared with all the teams of the Acrobat team. Here we provided in different sections the grouping of the materials and their types as well as the item names, the quantity, uh, where they could be found on Amazon and whatnot as well as the item description of each of these materials. 
And just to make it even more easily accessible, we provided the URL with all the links for each material. So after considering every material that would be used as attachments for the structures, for the swinging, and as well as the anchor weights and landing zones for our whole trapeze, we came to an estimated total of $655.38. We have run this by numerous times with Kurt, as well as Christopher, who has done a great job in leading the trapeze subcommittee and providing us with a lot of insight on the different materials that could be bought and should be bought and that would be the most efficient for the whole trapeze as a whole. This BOM for the trapeze was only done really with the consideration and helpful SOLIDWORKS models that were created to see how the trapeze itself would look like and how it could be done in the real world setting. Mm -hmm. And many of these materials are not as expensive as we had previously uh, thought. So given all the materials that could be shown here, we believe that $655 with 38 cents is a reasonable amount for the trapeze since it would be used by all the teams of the Acrobat team. And seeing that this is a long list, hopefully it is considered a good budget for the trapeze itself. In this section, we will discuss about the risk analysis pertaining to this Acrobat project. This project will be utilizing different types of materials that when combined together can add significant weight. And this weight will essentially be launched in the air and will somehow eventually need to come to a stop. The Acrobat and especially the trapeze system are not permanent structures and will need to be designed in a way in which it will be able to be disassembled. There will be potential risks that need to be considered when designing and working with the materials. The potential risks that need to be considered when working with the various components for this project include maybe running out of materials, which has a medium probability of occurring, which affects maybe the progression, makes it more slower, which when trying to find a solution, you may find alternative materials to solve that problem. Another problem that may arise would be damaged components, which has a low probability of occurring but may affect the loss of time if it does occur. And a solution may be to replace the components. One other problem that may arise is errors in the machining, which has a high probability of occurring as some parts will be machined, which may affect the loss of time. And some solutions could be to refabricate the components as you go along in the project. The potential risks that need to be considered when developing the design process for this project may include structural issues that occur and which have a high probability of occurring and may affect the parts or the components which may cause it to fail. A solution that could be possible would be adding reinforcing components. Another problem that may occur are low tolerances which have a high probability of occurring and may affect the components which makes them insecure. A possible solution may be to, ref to refabricate the parts entirely. Another problem that we may consider is the discrepancy in the CAD models, which has a low probability of occurring, but may affect how the components fit. One solution may be to update the CAD model entirely. The safety and feasibility of this project is a significant aspect that must be considered. The temporary structure that is being developed will undergo activities that may have safety levels that vary in range depending on the system and the hazards that may be faced during the duration of the testing and performing phase. Some of the basic safety guidelines that have been developed include the requirement to use personal protective equipment, which includes eye protection when using the trapeze structure. A safe perimeter will be established for the testing and performance phase of the acrobats. Safe working loads have also been established and frequent material inspections of all components of the structures will be performed as well as establishing an official safe and efficient procedure for its assembly and disassembly. At this point, we'll be summarizing the progress that we made in the fall 2022 semester.
In conclusion of our fall 2022 semester, we were able to complete phase one, which included delivering preliminary CAD designs. And that made it possible for us to be able to manufacture prototype number one of Gizmo. We also did extensive analysis and development of our electrical component selection, which made it possible for us to know how we will be moving forward with sensors. We also did development of our mechanical mechanisms, which include the limb mechanism, where we now know we'll be tackling that problem with servo motors. And we have now a idea of how we'll be tackling the grip mechanism. In the following slide, we'll be talking about what we'll be doing next in the winter and spring. Hello, just here in Atlas for one more time. Finally, we have reached summary and the specific section that I will be now concluding this presentation with is the winter and spring objectives. So as you have now heard throughout our slides, we have made sufficient amount of progress that we are now confident in beginning phase two of our Acrobat project. In phase two, we will be now doing this in the winter section before spring semester starts. This will include having the limb movement mechanism incorporated to our prototype. This is still missing from our actual prototype and we would love to have it implemented soon as possible before the spring semester begins. We will also be finalizing trapeze grip mechanism as it's really important after our discussion today with the research scientist Morgan Pope. He was very adamant of having this trapeze grip mechanism done fully and with our full intention, as it would be very crucial in determining the amount of trials and iterations that would be done when we reached phase three, known as the testing phase. Finally, for winter, we have the trapeze launch tower, which the trapeze team has set out to make before the spring semester begins, as it's once again incredibly important for every team's goals and objectives. And having all the electronics tested on it would be great to see as well. And for spring, after winter break and we come back, will we, have, we will have completed phase two and begin phase three. Phase three, is a lot of testing on our part and a lot of the testing will be done from the electrical, the power and the hardware software and software. In this stage, we hope to have everything finalized by then to be able to just focus on the testing parameters and having our Acrobat do the autonomous motions that we have first set out when we first began this project in early September. With that, I want to thank Kurt as well as Dr. Thornburn for the help that they have provided our team throughout the semester. And end by saying that we are very thankful with all the feedback that has been communicated with us throughout. I do not think we would have been able to do this type of research and work without that help. So once again, Thank you very much. Come spring semester, we hope to have everything implemented and working function fully, and that we're able to be successful in the objectives that we set out in our schedule, as well as our work breakdown as well. Thank you so much, and hopefully you enjoy the slides that were presented today. Have a great winter break. Thank you.